Please welcome to the stage, you know her from the ballot you filled out voting her into office. Put your hands together for the chair of the Progressive Caucus, your member of Congress, Pramila Jayapal. Hi, hi, thank you for being here. Man. Well, I guess you're not going anywhere. Thank you for being here. It is so great to be here. Welcome to Seattle. It's great to be here. I want to start with this. Your sister just announced that she's running for Congress in a city. It's this, um, it's really a town that thinks it's a city. Uh, it's like basically, yeah, it's, it's called Portland. I, I know you're very supportive of your sister, but come on, is there anything you do that she doesn't try to do? Is there, can't the Congress be your thing? Wasn't Congress your thing? Don't you have one, can't one thing just be yours? No, it's true, one thing. I mean, I literally said to her, you have so many professions you can be in, but you wanna to come to Congress? No, I'm really thrilled. She's gonna be an amazing member of Congress. I hope you all get to know her, she's wonderful. It's cool. I hope you both get to be in Congress. That'd be so fun. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, you know, sisters, I don't, brings its own. We're not living together. Right. Just letting you know. We're not oh staying God. in the same apartment. That's the show. <laughs> no. and, and she's That's <laughs> the fucking show. Right, why wouldn't you, you know, I mean, Chuck Schumer lived with like Dick Durbin on a pullout for like years. I bet your sister's a better roommate than Chuck Schumer. It's going to be our version of Alpha House. Yeah, know? right, exactly. Hey, what do you think about Amazon sending drones to basically poop packages onto our lawns? We have a video. <laughs> I, hey, hey, listen, listen. I know a lot of people in your district work for this conglomerate, but... You can, this is, this is not good, right? We it don't want this. It is not good. It is not good. We love the people that work for Amazon, but Amazon does need to be broken up. It is a monopoly. <laughs> and this, I mean, this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. There's oh. definitely somebody who is going to get hit. 100%. With this. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, my dumbbells are here. <laughs> Where's the dog? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm just, you're... No. To your point, and not to mine. The FTC sued Amazon in September. That came after a 16th month investigation by the House Antitrust Subcommittee, on which uh, you're vice chair. That investigation led to a number of bipartisan bills which go after monopolies. Uh, there's been a bunch of revelations just last few days, some of the practices inside of Amazon. What's your, what's your reaction to the most recent round of information we've gleaned from this FTC lawsuit? And uh, yeah, what did you make of it? Well, I mean, you know, the most recent lawsuit, and there's a lot that's redacted, but the stuff that's in there is stunning. Amazon got rid of a whole bunch of documents, first of all. I know you talked about that in yeah. your monologue. Um, that is always a problem when they start getting rid of documents. You know there's a problem. But also, it's all the stuff that we found in our antitrust investigation, right? Like controlling the price, making sure that nobody else, no small business could be out there selling a product because you could take that product from them. You could see which things do well and then use that information to make your own that undercuts it. And I think this is, you know, I tweeted about this and said Microsoft also changed many, many years ago because of a lawsuit, because of an antitrust lawsuit. And everyone believes that that was a good thing for competition, for small business, um, for consumers. Even Microsoft thinks that. And so I think Amazon has just gotten too big to care. They're, they are um, engaging in practices that are both monopolistic and also hurt workers and hurt small businesses. And I think we'll see where this FTC lawsuit goes, but I think it's really important to take it on. The issue of 
the anti-competitive practices of big tech companies, it's a rare issue in which there's a little bit of a of a um, ideological scramble. It doesn't neatly align. You have members of the right that think this is an important issue. I think you have, you have uh, uh, members of the left that think this is an important issue. Is there any hope for any kind of legislation that could make it through uh, this Congress? I don't know about this Congress, but we did get all those bills passed. <laughs> I mean... I'm, a I'm asking. I'm curious. <laughs> I don't know about this Congress, but... You never know, and I do think all of our bills made it through the committee in the last Congress, and Democrats controlled the House then, but it was still hard to bring it to the floor. Um, my good friend Ken Buck on the other side has been our champion on, on this issue, um, and we have talked about, is it possible to at least bring the, there's a, a newspaper competition bill, basically, that is probably the lowest hanging fruit. I think it's possible we could get that passed and help all of our independent newspapers across the country to survive. I think that would be a really, really important bill. I'm trying to think if there's some way we could connect the effort to make these giant companies more competitive with Noah's Ark. sort of incept the idea that I'm not, I don't have it. But we can noodle. I was noodle. Waiting, John. I was really I don't, Noah's Ark, the tech company's competition. Tell me, tell me. Well, just sort of, you know, the dinosaurs were quite big and <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> We just went through uh, a, a week in which there was a vote to expel Congressman, um, he's also uh, um, the inventor of Beanie Babies, George Santos, your colleague. <laughs> so that's his pedigree. Um, a lot of the movie Invictus is based on his life. It's a really moving story about people coming together at a difficult time. But there was a vote to expel him that came from New York Republicans that, that failed. There was a resolution by Marjorie Taylor Greene to censure uh, Rashida Tlaib. There was a, then a, a competing measure to censure Marjorie Taylor Greene. Is it uh, frustrating to you having all this free time? <laughs> because we've solved all the problems? You know, um, it really is frustrating. It's like... We spend so much time there, and we have so much work to do, right? We have so many people who are hurting across the country, so many good things we could do, and we literally go there, and we do this BS stuff. It's censures, it's bills that cut, you know, the education department by 80%, right? It's like, don't say gay laws. It's all these horrific um, things. They'll add on a, you know, a federal abortion ban. Why not? Let's put it into some piece of legislation. And it is absolutely infuriating and it's become I mean it's just hard because we want people to have faith in government and it's very difficult to have faith in government with Meg and Mike Johnson as speaker or with Kevin McCarthy or with any of these people I mean it's same menu different waiter and um, so speaking of them speaking of the menu and we got to shut this restaurant down by the way but uh, you know, we just went through this ridiculous fight where we didn't have a speaker for all these weeks, and we end up in many respects where we began, which is if there's any hope to prevent a default, fund the government, uh, that has to, by definition, be bipartisan. Democrats control the Senate and the White House. Republicans control the House. The, the, every bill that's happened uh, under this Congress to, to keep the government open and fund the government and prevent us from default has been bipartisan. What happens? We're a few weeks away from a potential shutdown. Um, we're gonna, the same structural issues are coming for Mike Johnson uh, that came for Kevin. Yeah, because he's also catering to the extreme, well, he is part of that caucus. The Freedom Caucus loves him. They're willing to um, get rid of the motion to vacate, which is that rule that allowed just one single person to get rid of the speaker. They like the speaker, so they wanna keep that. Uh, you know, they want to get rid of it now and they want to keep him, but 
we're going to have to pass a clean continuing resolution. There's no other way to do it. And so at some point, probably on the 16th, because funding runs out on the 17th, so probably literally on the 17th morning, there will be a big fight, and then right before the government is about to shut down, we will pass a clean continuing resolution. Really what should happen is the Senate should send us all of this so that they jam us in the House and it's right there and we can just vote on the Senate bill. Because last time what happened is the Senate didn't send us anything and then it got down to the very end and we didn't have anything and so everything just took even longer to get done. No, and I think it's good that this is how we run <laughs> our country. I, I definitely think that America should basically operate like uh, a small contracting business run by two brothers who fucking hate each other. That's cool. That's how it should be. Just two, just two certified plumbers who can't make eye contact anymore. All right, I do want to. I do want to ask you something. Look, this. It is a challenge doing this show at a time in which the news can be very, very hard and very bleak. And I did want to talk to you about this because I, I consider you somebody who really thinks a lot about, uh, about how to be a representative of the progressive left in a way that is open, that tries to bring people in. So you sign on to a resolution introduced by Cori Bush and others calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. And I wanted to ask you about this resolution, not because I think this resolution is of outsized importance, but I, I just truly want to use it as an example, because I, I genuinely want to know what you think about this, because you know, even as senators and members of Congress are now increasingly calling for a ceasefire, calling for a humanitarian pause, generally uh, speaking out against Israel's conduct of the war, and are increasingly being open about how horrified they are by the sort of indefensible toll on civilians, and it is indefensible. Fewer than 20 members of Congress have signed on to that resolution. Now, the resolution does not explicitly reference Hamas terrorism or the fact that Israel's military campaign in Gaza is a, is a direct response to the worst atrocity committed against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. The resolution says armed violence has claimed the lives of Palestinians and Israelis. And my reaction when I saw that is, oh, I don't, this wasn't written to persuade that this was written in a way that could alienate people. You know, Barack Obama spoke with uh, John and Tommy and Dan and Alyssa uh, in Chicago to mark the 15th anniversary of the Obama campaign, and he talked about the importance, especially on an issue like this, to listen to people and bring people in. Isn't the most powerful way that the left in Congress and in this country can advocate on behalf of the lives of Palestinians, the humanity of Palestinians, is to be in solidarity with your colleagues and with millions of people who are horrified by what's unfolding in Gaza and settler violence in the West Bank, but reject responses, are mistrustful of responses that diminish the humanity and security of Israelis. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is... I think that's beautifully said. And actually, um, I think we should think about legislation as one part of how we respond in any moment. So the day before I signed on to the legislation, I issued a statement with six others um, that called for a ceasefire, called for a cessation of hostilities. In that statement, we talked about October 7th. We condemned what Hamas did. We uh, talked about the fact that it was the, the worst um, incident of killing Jews since the Holocaust. We talked about uh, all of the ways, and we, we said Israel has a right to self-defense because it, it felt important to contextualize what we were calling for in the universal horrors that are around us. And what happened on October 7th was a horror. And what is happening now in Gaza is an absolute horror. And so you, we wanted to say that we were calling for a ceasefire both because you need to save, and by the way, I called for a ceasefire or at minimum a cessation of hostilities because I think this is also something that's not super well known, but 
A ceasefire is a negotiated agreement. It actually takes often a long time to do a ceasefire. It has many things that have to be a part of it. It usually is about a longer term solution. A, a cessation of hostilities can happen today. Israel can say today, we're going to cease hostilities. Um, and so it felt important to me to also give that duality to it. But I think that the, the challenge is that it doesn't, um, you, if you believe in international humanitarian law, that does not look at the justification for why a conflict started. It doesn't look at who was right, who was wrong. It just says we need to minimize the impact on civilian lives. And today, John, I mean, you know this, 9,000 plus people in Gaza, Palestinians have been killed. Over 3,000 are children. One child is being murdered every 10 minutes in Gaza. And there is no question in my mind, and I came into this work as a peace activist after in, in 2001 against the Iraq war, and there is no question in my mind that the military solution here in Gaza is not going to get Israel peace and security. It's not going to get Palestinians peace and security and self-determination. It's not going to bring back the hostages. I've continuously called for the hostages all to be released. Um, but it's not going to achieve any of those things. And so that's why, for me, the, the resolution is a resolution. It's a piece of legislation. It's there. But it's very important for me to contextualize everything that I've been saying because, and it's even hard on Twitter, you know, I hardly ever put out statements with tweets that are threads because somebody will just take one tweet and say, you haven't called for the hostages to be released. I have. I've talked about Hamas. I've talked, And I think that in, at the end of the day, we all have to recognize there is so much trauma in the world. And this is what strikes me again and again. There is so much trauma. There is so much pain. There's so much historical context that, and lived experience that is all part of everything that we're dealing with. And it is incredibly complex. I don't think there is a single person who knows exactly what the answer is. We don't. We don't know. This is a very complicated question. But for me, I do think that recognizing the humanity and the pain of Israelis and of Palestinians is very important. And I wish that we didn't always have just one or the other recognized. That is almost every resolution. Yeah. Is well, this is why I wanted to ask about it is because... So the resolution that did pass was the one that was uh, very much written in defense of, in support of Israel. I think that's something like 412 votes. You voted present. And I, I understand the hesitation because of the way that resolution was written. But you step back and you look at the politics and you say, there are 412 members of Congress that felt like it was important to make this statement. There are 18 that got behind a ceasefire that was focused on a cessation of violence to protect Palestinian lives. And what I see in that is, uh, how do we make, sh how, what is the best and most powerful way that the left in this country can represent, advocate for peace, right? And when I see protesters saying from the river to the sea, when I see uh, people talking about um, uh, settler colonialism or, or sort of other jargon that implies a kind of illegitimacy, a fundamental illegitimacy of Israel. A, like that's sort of anathema, anathema to me as, as a Jewish person. But also, I, I find it really upsetting because I say, it's like, oh my, you've just told all these people that support Israel's right to defend itself and Israel's right to exist that, that they don't, that they shouldn't listen to you or that they should mistrust you or that you're not in common cause with them, that you're not in a coalition with them. And I don't know, I, obviously, I'm just a, a dumb podcast person, but I, I, don't, I, I don't have the answer either, but I, I find, like, I want so desperately for especially the people that I, I view as my friends on the left to find a way to talk about this that builds that bigger coalition. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do, and I think we're trying... 
I feel like that's what I'm trying to do every day. And I think what happens is there is a focus on one or the other. And like that resolution was a perfect example. I, if I were to go back over the seven years and look at all the resolutions that are about anti-Semitism, um, there's hundreds of them and it's very important. But there is one Palestinian American woman in the house, her name is Rashida Tlaib. And I think that there, there is almost never a mention even, and in that Meeks McCall resolution, it actually didn't mention Palestinians. I signed on to that resolution, by the way, when it first came out, because it was in the moment and I really felt it was important, despite the fact that there was no mention of anything else. I felt like it didn't matter. It was still important. But 18 days later, 6,000 bombs had been dropped on Palestine. That's more bombs in one year, in six days, than we dropped on Afghanistan in 2019 in an entire year. And 6,000 people had already been killed. And so at that point, it felt like part of the problem, fast forward, is that Bibi Netanyahu does not seem to feel any need to stop what he is doing. And the United States is one of the most important partners in that relationship. We give more to Israeli military aid than any country except Israel. So we are the major backer. And I think that there has been a leniency around how we address this question since, since, since October 7th, of how we address this question of international humanitarian law. Do we believe that Israel should follow war, laws of war? Do we believe that, um, just like we said, Russia should, you know, it was bad when Russia laid siege to Ukraine and stopped fuel and stopped. Now, I'm not trying to compare them because they are very different situations. But again, international law does not require that you look at the underlying thing. It's about saving lives. So for the left, I think what we have to do is, first of all, we have to be willing to condemn what Hamas did. We have to be willing to condemn Hamas as a terrorist organization. And, and I think we have to be willing to look at the trauma and the pain of innocent civilians. I think for everybody else also, there also has to be, I mean, I was so moved when I saw President Obama speak because on this topic just, just yesterday or the day before, I think on, on the pod, because he mentioned the word occupation. What other president has mentioned the word occupation? So for Palestinians who are there and who are seeing, who they themselves are stateless, they are stateless people. I mean, they were, many of them moved into the West, into, the, into Gaza because out of Israel, um, and some moved into Lebanon. So I think there has to be, comp and I know this is gonna sound, this is who I am. I believe there has to be compassion and love and embrace of everybody for who they are. And I don't believe that military action is the way to resolve any of these problems. It, it, it just hasn't. Thank you for having that conversation. I'm giving, we're gonna, we're just changing gears. Just as much as humans can change gears, we're about to do it. Everybody share, we're doing it. I'm doing it right now. We're gonna, everybody, okay? All right. The gears have changed. <laughs> it's time for 24 hours in Seattle. All right, here's how this works. I, you're the expert on Seattle. I'm just a visitor who saw Frasier. Would you come with me to Pike Place Market at dawn and use your personal warmth and political clout to get them to let me throw a fish? Yes, I can take you there. They will let you throw a fish. Hell yeah! Absolutely. <laughs> hey, this barge got loose in Elliott Bay and crashed into a barrier. Um, Captain Dan Kreebel saw the barge and then jumped in his Kings County water taxi and pushed the barge to a safer area. What, what, are, what are your plans? How can you bring the resources of the federal government to bear to, 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 to throw a parade for the Sully Sullenberger of Seattle? He's a great captain. He is what a, a great look captain, at that. a great crew. Look at that. I know, it was amazing. Hey, these ships are too big. 
they're causing all kinds of problems. They're blocking the Suez Canal or whatever. They're crashing into the Space Needle now. <laughs> Speaking of the Space Needle, has it ever successfully called an alien to the planet? <laughs> and is that its purpose? That is its purpose, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> what? What goes on up there? Is there a restaurant up Have there? Have you been up there? I, I believe when I was a child. <laughs> There's a restaurant up there. Um, it is a gorgeous view. Here's the thing about the Space Needle. I mean, I can't believe that it was built so long ago, but it still feels iconic, doesn't it? Like, it is still a central place in Seattle. I love it. Does it have a glass floor? Now it does. It didn't used to, but now it does, yeah. That's a scary project. It turns, right? I haven't been up there since it's been totally remodeled, doesn't it? It spins yeah. now? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which way? Around, uh, on a what axis? Okay. <laughs> we are recording this on Saturday evening. Daylight saving time ends. So we get an extra hour of sleep, but now the morning people, they get an extra hour of sunlight in the morning, and, and, the, and, the, and the cool people, we gotta go to, we gotta go, we get dinner in the dark. What, what's your, have you taken any kind of position on this daylight saving time? I want one time. One time? I want one time. Okay. Yeah. Now, now but, look. But I, I just want to confess, I am a morning person. You, you, by the way, by the way, I want, I want, there's a thousand people here. One thousand people knew you were a morning person. You have such morning person energy. I mean, no disrespect. I, I just, I have no doubt that, that when you and your sister were growing up, that fucking house, you guys were I up. A, I think she's a nighttime person. I mean, I'm a morning person because I have to fly back and forth across the coast. So for me, I'd rather stay on DC time, right? Yeah. So I come home, so like right around now is kind of bedtime, you know? <laughs> Which is why they're telling me to wrap it up. Uh, last question. You, you represent Seattle. Your sister is running to represent Portland. I'd like to get a rivalry going. Can we just shit talk Portland for two minutes? Where do those people get off? Are they kidding? They're like our little sister, you know? <laughs> Portland. Portland is like the little sister. I mean, they got cute neighborhoods, you know? I like that. They that was patronizing. Like sweet little neighborhoods. They've got good food trucks. But I mean, we're Seattle. And Seattle well, rules. And the thing, about, the thing about a Portland food truck, it's two hours away from being a Seattle food truck. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Exactly. Congresswoman Jayapal, thank you so much for your time thank tonight. You, this is great. So appreciate it. One more time. Your member of Congress. Thank you so much.